Hey Tank Dorks, Sophie here with this T-72 M1 captured in the Gulf War in 1991. Some of you might remember it from its time at Knox. It's well preserved here at the amazing Armour and Cavalry Collection at Fort Moore, Georgia. And today I have a special guest to share a bit from his own studies about the T-72. Watch along and hopefully, like I did, learn something new. Hi everyone, I'm Jim Warford, as Sophie said. I am a retired U.S. Army Armor Officer. Uh, I'm here at the collection enjoying this great collection of vehicles here. I am a qualified tank commander on the M60A1 Rise Passive, a qualified tank commander on the M60A3 TTS, and a qualified tank commander on the M1. Also, I'm a qualified Bradley commander on the M3 CFV. I've been a student and historian of Soviet armor for over 50 years. In, in addition to that experience, I've also published over 30 articles in Armor Magazine and the Journal of Military Ordnance. Uh, this is the second video I've had the opportunity to work with Sophie on. Uh, this is the first time in front of the camera. So here we go. So in this video, we're gonna look at the T-72M1. It's gonna be a quick video, but we're gonna cover some information, hopefully some details you haven't heard up to this point. So the history of the T-72M1 actually starts in the Middle East, in Lebanon. In 1982, the Israeli Defense Forces invaded southern Lebanon with the intent of moving the PLO forces out of the south and ultimately dislodging the PLO and all the Syrian army out of the country. In 1982, a battle was held at a village called Sultan Yaqub, pardon my pronunciation, where eight Israeli Magok tanks, which are modified American M48s, were destroyed or captured by the PLO and Syrian forces. Since then, a few of them have been accounted for, although not all. One was actually paraded through Damascus with its captured Israeli crew, and that was captured by Times, a Times Magazine reporter. The other tanks are a bit more mysterious. There's a rumor where one was destroyed on a live fire range in Russia and not recovered. There are at least two of the Magok tanks that we know for sure. One is in Russia on display at the Kubinka Tank Museum. The other is actually a tug that's used to move other vehicle, armored vehicles around uh, that museum in Russia. Okay, when the tanks arrived in Russia, they arrive along with a horrific rumor, which has since been denied and disproven, that the tanks arrived in Russia with the remains of the dead Israeli tank crews. And again, that's been disproved, thank goodness. But the tanks did arrive in Russia with some interesting cargo on board. One, they had the personal effects from those missing Israeli uh, tank crewmen, and they also had a brand new item, the Israeli M111 Hetz or Arrow APFSDS ammunition, something cutting edge in those days. So first of all, let's start off with the crew's personal effects. After the fighting in Lebanon in 1982, the Israeli POW MIA organizations got very actively involved trying to determine the whereabouts of those missing Israeli crewmen. And they knew about the three that were in the paraded in Damascus, but they didn't know much else. The, the word that these, the personal effects of the crews, they got back to Israel that had been sent to Russia, they organized a really strong effort to learn more about the whereabouts of the crews and those personal effects. After decades of work and political going back and forth, ultimately agreement was reached. In 2016, Prime Minister Netanyahu led a delegation from Israel to Moscow and ultimately to Kubinka, where they were gonna exchange the tank on display in the museum, very special to Israeli military history and to those POW MIA organizations with a less important Magok tank. And just do an exact exchange tank for tank. That took place in 2016, and after a lot of work and effort, that specific captured Magok actually made it back to Israel. Of that important cargo I mentioned earlier, the most important regarding the T-72M1 was the ammo that the tank had on board. And again, that's the Israeli M111 Hetz or Arrow APFS DS ammunition. Cutting edge ammunition of its time, and the value to the Russians of being able to test and evaluate that ammunition cannot be overstated. It was a very, very important deal for them to get that ammunition. According to Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, the Israelis destroyed nine T-72 tanks during the fighting in 1982. Those were the older Ural version, not the T-72M1 like this one here. Other sources say as many as 20, 20 to 25 T-72s were destroyed by the IDF by a variety of different weapons. Whatever the case, that was an older tank and was the predecessor to what we're standing, what we're looking at here at the Armored Cavalry Collection. The Russians made it a priority to test this new ammunition, and in 1983, live fire tests were conducted. During live fire trials in 1983, the Russians realized very quickly that they needed to provide an export tank to their allies that had the ability to defeat this new Israeli 105 millimeter ammunition. In effect, 
provide the same level of armor protection as the non-export T-72A in a new form that could be exported, and that's what resulted in the T-72M1. So this was a direct result of what they learned through those live fire trials. In fact, after the fighting, the, that ammunition performed so well that several countries adopted that for their own armies, including the German army, where it was known as the DM-23. So at this point, matters actually went from bad to worse for the U.S. We had our own problems with our 105 millimeter ammunition and most people didn't know about that at the time. That was an issue throughout my career as a tank platoon leader and company commander, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. In 1980, General Stray reported to the command that we were having severe problems with the production of these new AP FSDS ammunition. And it was affecting both M735 and the newer XM774. It was both production problems and lot failure, in addition to poor armor penetration performance. In 1984, the CIA reported that they did not believe there was a single round, 105 millimeter round, in the US or Western inventories that would penetrate the frontal armor of the new Soviet tanks. In 1990, the Marine Corps reported that based on Army testing, no depleted uranium 105 millimeter rounds would defeat the frontal armor protecting Soviet export tanks, specifically talking about the T-72M1. Finally, in 1992, when the first edition of FM 71-123 was published, which I co-authored, we focused very specifically on defensive engagements where enemy tanks would be engaged from the flank and rear. Now, why did we do that? Because we had to, because of the limitations of our 105 and the new AP FSDS ammunition. The result of all this is that when I was in my tank in my tank platoon, the primary anti-armor ammunition I had would not defeat Soviet export tanks. When I was in my tank company years later, the much newer version of the AP FSDS ammunition that we had might have penetrated the armor on the front of the T-72M1, maybe, no guarantee. Now, let's take a close detailed look at the armor I've been talking about. One of the first mentions of the Russian use of composite tank armor came from a formerly top secret Soviet article published in 1961. These early composite armor designs are very similar to the composite armor protecting this T-72M1, which appeared many years later in 1983. The difference was the impact it caused around the world. Official Russian sources, that's the information that they provide to their export customers, confirm that the T-72M1 frontal armor protected the tank against Israeli M111, US M735, US M735A1, and US M774 ammunition, as well as all 105 millimeter heat ammunition. The armor protecting the T-72M1 basically took Western 105 millimeter main guns and their ammo off the table. The Glacis is a four layer array, 16 millimeter, 60 millimeter, 105 millimeter, and 50 millimeter, set up as a steel, Texolite steel array. The 16 millimeter faceplate is often overlooked by some sources, and it's actually a key identification feature of the T-72M1. The actual thickness of the Glacis is 231 millimeters, angled at 68 degrees, which provides an effective thickness of 617 millimeters. The non-metallic layer is armored glass textolite, or STB, which is similar to glass reinforced plastic. The turret frontal armor is a three layer array, 142 millimeters, 115 millimeters, and 284 millimeters. Steel, composite filler, and steel, with an actual thickness of 541 millimeters. This ceramic and steel composite armor was known unofficially in the US as CERMET, ceramic and metal. The ceramic composite filler is a combination of quartz, which is spelled with a K in Russian, and corundum or corund, also spelled with a K in Russian. The armor had the additional nickname during the Cold War, Combination K, a nickname probably based on the, the Russian spelling of the ceramic materials used, quartz and corund. Years before the U.S. forces faced the, these T-72s in combat during Desert Storm, we already had a lot of experience with the tank, and more than you might think. It was reported by the Associated Press in 1987 that several T-72s were acquired by the CIA and that the U.S. had started testing them. Then in 1994, it was also reported by the Washington Post that it was in fact 12 T-72s. And then finally, based on former East German and Czechoslovakian paperwork, it was in fact 12 T-72M1s, just like this one, that were acquired by the U.S. three years before Desert Shield. So we had these tanks in hand to study and evaluate three years before Desert Shield and certainly before Desert Storm. 
So what was the outcome of that? Well, the outcome was the decision made by the U.S. to get as many tanks with a 120 millimeter main gun into theater as possible before shooting started in Desert Storm. So some T-72 M1s are more equal than others. And what I mean by that is they don't have the same turret armor frontal protection. And the story behind that is really interesting. It has to go to perhaps where the tanks were made, whether they were made in Russia or in Czechoslovakia or Poland. When we acquired those 12 T-72 M1s, it was obvious, and this was confirmed by testing in Europe, that some tanks were protected by the Sermet composite armor that I, I mentioned earlier, but others were, there was no Sermet, others were filled with just loose grain sand that is part of the turret casting process. And we don't know for sure, but it's likely that those tanks with the less effective armor protection were actually the ones built in Poland and Czechoslovakia, while the ones that were built in Russia had the more effective, better performing Sermet composite armor. Any evaluation of the T-72 M1 has to be kept in context because it's hard to take tanks that were built so many years ago and compare them to military situa situations and tanks that were built much later, much more recently. An example of that is when you look at the T-72 M1, it was designed from the very beginning to have a tank that was protected by armor that would take the 105 millimeter main gun and its ammo off the table in 1983. And it did that successfully. The other component of context has to do with what the T-72 did not accomplish. And what it didn't accomplish is a characteristic design flaw, a de defining design flaw that affects all tanks of this generation, T-64s, T-72s, T-80s and beyond. And that failure is to separate the crew from semi-combustible ammunition. So the Soviets relied on the armor protecting tanks like the T-72 M1 to either eliminate or altogether prevent penetration of the armor so the crew would be safe. The challenge with that though is that armor has advanced and main guns have advanced. So this armor is no longer cutting edge, which means it can be penetrated. So by failing to respond to that and keep up with the threat, now a solid penetration of the armor almost always means a catastrophic loss of the tank and more importantly the crew. So the failure to deal with this characteristic flaw in its design has marked the battlefields all around the world for decades. In fact, it's happening in Ukraine right now that you find tanks of this generation with their turrets blown off the hulls by exploding onboard ammunition because the armor is now out of date and isn't keeping up with the threat provided by the 120 millimeter main guns. This failure is a key issue that will need to be addressed with future Soviet tanks going forward, but that's a topic for another video. If you would like to see this tank and more of the incredible collection of armor there, follow them on their pages linked below for more details about the open house dates and their progress. Special thank you to Mr. Jim Warford for his time and assistance, and also this great tank helmet. You might remember his work from one of my previous videos, but it was great fun to get together and record in person. Let me know in the comments which Soviet-era tank you'd like us to cover next, and I will see you next time.